today marks a, a year since the World Health Organization declared global pandemic and we thought it'd be a useful opportunity for us to take a bit of a look back at what we've achieved over the last year and we're delighted to welcome Lord Bird um, MBE and co-founder of The Big Issue um, uh, to join joining us today to um, say a bit of a thank you and to kind of uh, share some insights um, with us uh, today and we've got a, a really varied um, morning or hour that's going to take us quickly whizzing through to 12.30 um, uh, th th today with some uh, other really great interjections throughout the morning. So without further ado, I'll um, hand over to um, Lord Bird, um, if that's OK. Great. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for asking me. It is incredibly significant. Uh, sorry, my son's bringing me a cup of tea. Thank you. Thank you. Go out. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So it's in, in, it's incredibly significant uh, that this is a whole year. I didn't even know about about today being the day when the World Health Authority declared the pandemic. And in that year, I, all of our lives have been turned upside down in some ways or other. And I'll just give you an idea of how it, the significance of it and how it's turned my life up to, upside down. Because, uh, you know, a year ago, uh, the big issue was selling thousands of copies a week um, uh, through its, uh, I think it was about two and a half thousand vendors throughout the United Kingdom. And then when the pandemic, when we were in, advised uh, to to remove our vendors from the streets because of the health ish, issue and also because the streets were empty in March, we did that and we then reformulated what we were doing and it's led to an enormous change in how we uh, now work with homeless people. We're working, uh, I would say, and this is a contradiction, a lot closer. We've got much more uh, uh, buy-in from people in need uh, with the whole idea that we need to take them somewhere else. It's very, very difficult to say to people, look, you know, we need you in house or we need you um, addressing some of the problems of health and mental well-being on the streets. And main, mainly the, the, uh, we were, uh, you know, uh, we were banging on a, on a highly, you know, on a solid door that wasn't being opened. But things have changed. People have started to think of themselves as uh, people who are perilous uh, the, the possibility that they're here today and gone tomorrow has very, very much uh, returned to this generation. And I think it had been lost in my generation, but the generation before me, obviously, in the Second World War, uh, had that kind of perilousness. But what it also did, and this is why I'm so privileged to uh, to be speaking to you, is it drove home the idea that at last, a government for the first time since the Victorian period had put their arms around the most dispossessed people on the streets. And that to me was an incredibly moving experience. I know because we were involved, I know it wasn't as clean and as all, uh, you know, as well prepared as, as it could have been. Uh, if we'd had a long time to plan. I know that there were critics. I know there were many homeless people I met or a number of homeless people I met who didn't like the idea of somebody putting the, uh, a hand out around them. I know that we helped, uh, and I'm sure you did as well, help people who were disgruntled and just wanted to go off and have cigarettes and do whatever else they were doing outside of uh, the protection that you're offering them. But what it actually raised and this I think you should be very, very proud of because your work was very, very central in the part of England that you were working in. What it raised was the possibility, the potential for the first time we could end or stop rough sleeping. That to me is one of the greatest uh, uh, experiences I have uh, lived through. As a person who uh, many, many decades ago was themselves a rough sleeper 
as a person who was in and out of the prison system, as a person who was running away and had drink and drugs and psychological problems, uh, the fur for the very idea that the kind of people that I had been or had come from or had passed through, because obviously I'm out of it, that somebody had put their arms around the whole group that, uh, that, that uh, of people in this real need was was just an absolute marvel. So to me, I will remember 2020 as the year of the death of many people I know who unfortunately uh, didn't make it. A, a vast amount of people I know who have lost their jobs, and I'm sure we all do, a really challenging time. But it showed the seeds of something which I had never felt I would see. When I started the big issue with Gordon Roddick of the Body Shop and Anita Roddick of the Body Shop 30 years ago, 30 years this year, one of the things we were doing was try to give homeless people and people on the streets an alternative to begging, an alternative to prostitution because there were rent boys and rent girls and giving them an, an opportunity to not get themselves into shoplifting and, you know, uh, all the other things, mugging, and they were doing all sorts of things because a lot of them were taking drugs and were heavily uh, into drink. And so when we started, we worked and in the crudest form of, of social intervention you could imagine, which was a, to a crime prevention program. Our argument was if you were going to, to commit crime, to feed your habits, why not? And this was the thing that really cheesed every other homeless organization off. We said, no, no, no. At the moment, people are breaking the law to feed their habits. Why not give them a legitimate means of making money and then decriminalize them? And then we would be able to address some of the problems of the drugs, of the mental health, of the, of the you know, obsession with, with uh, gambling or whatever there were, were things. So we tried to do that dumb thing. We never ever looked at the idea of trying to stop people sleeping on the streets. And what we did was coerced or encourage people off the streets and work with organizations to house them and whatever. But we never ever thought there would be a possibility that one day the government, local authorities, the NHS would say, why can't we end the tyranny? Why can't we end the human rights abuse, which is leaving people on the streets? In my opinion, it is a killer. In my opinion, I have never met anybody on the streets who was living a full and happy and clear life. Actually, one person. I did meet one person, an ex-paratrooper who had done everything, you know, kind of walked backwards to the pole and all sorts of things. And all he wanted to do was live in a London park and have a brilliant time. And he was the only human being, but I could never meet anybody else who didn't say, look, my life needs to be improved. I don't know how to do it. Is there anybody there who can give me the leadership so I can take a lead in my own life? So interestingly, when, uh, the, when the pandemic hit, and the the uh, uh, you know no everyone in thing it was uh, i mean i i was in tears because i'd never thought that it would ever be possible what it's also done is it's changed me we are now in the process of making a film about the 30 years of the big issues uh, uh, creation but it's not going to be a kind of, oh, what a wonderful bunch of people. What a wonderful, what have they done? Look at these marvellous things. Uh, we're a curious egg like everybody else, good in parts. We are all, we should bless ourselves that we can be honest enough to say we don't always get it right. So we're making this film and the film is going to be about how can we stop homelessness? How, sorry, how can we stop rough sleeping? Let's start there. We'll move on to homelessness. And it is the first time that I have ever felt optimistic that I can work with organisations and organisations can work with us. And we can all try and come together. And through, through the community, through the, uh, 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 through the areas, through the 
through, through the towns and the communities throughout Great Britain, uh, sorry, UK, we can actually get to a situation where we can say that, that rough sleeping was something that we passed through. I'll just give you a little bit of history, uh, if you don't mind. And if I'm taking up your time, just put your hand up and I'll shut up because I'm very good at being told to shut up. I've had people doing it. I'm now 75 and I'm still being told to shut up. In 1960, 61, I was a runaway, a runaway from home. I was brought up as a London Irish Catholic. Uh, I didn't get on with the church. I didn't get on with my school. I didn't get on with my parents. I got on very well with the local magistrates who kept putting me away for shoplifting, housebreaking, stealing cars and all sorts of things. I was a complete pain in the derriere. Anyway, in 1961, 60, 61, I was running away from home and the police, if they ever found you rough sleeping, they would take you to court. And if you were begging, they would take you to court. It was called NFA, no fixed abode. At that particular time, they stopped doing that because the magistrate said they're in one, they're coming in, uh, they're in one day uh, and they're back in a, in a couple of weeks time uh, once they're out again. So it's a revolving door. So they said, we're not gonna pro prose prosecute people. So what happened was they completely stopped doing the bank uh, stopping people's rough sleeping. That is why from 1960, 61, all the way up to now, we have had in a steady, though dips and troughs, depending on what the government did, we have dips and troughs around rough sleeping. And it became institutionalized. The public became useful, used to the idea that they were walking down the streets and somebody would give them money they would give somebody money, they'd feel pretty good about it and move on and give people the reason to be on the streets. It did not address the mental health, the physical health problems that were being thrown up by, by rough sleeping and sleeping out of doors. That now, fortunately, because of the incredible, incredible attitude and response of organisations like yourself, that has now meant that we can now say, no, we won't ignore this problem. What we'll do is we will address the problem. So we're going to try and stop rough sleeping. We're going to try and uh, get the government to do something. There's homeless first, as you'll know about. There'll be, there's all sorts of communities that we know about. We are going to advocate in the film that we might look upon this as a, men, a mental and a physical health issue and a human rights issue. These are the three things we cannot let, let, uh, ignore them. I have five children. I don't have five children. I have five million children because I'm one of those gits who believes that every child out there, at whatever age they are, every child out there is our duty, our duty to help and to move on from from uh, if they're har self-harming themselves, we have a duty to respond to them. So anyway, I, w I won't go, I can't even, I'm not very good at time, I've probably been on too long. Really, I really want to say thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you for the hard work, for the risks that you took, for the mistakes that you made from which you will, will learn, from the opportunities you made to demonstrate our, our humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Lord Bird. That was truly inspirational. And I know everybody will take great heart from that. Um, and it leads us really nicely into um, our next uh, piece with Saskia and Nick, who's who've done some work um, kind of looking at uh, the individual experiences of people um, who've gone through the everyone in process. Um, and they they talked a little bit about their work earlier on in the pandemic and they built on on that. So we're um, really good to get a bit of an update of where they've got to with with that. So I'll hand over to Saskia and Nick. That's great. Thanks, Emma. Um, uh, exactly. We were going to uh, pick up some of the points that you're making, Lord Bird. It's, uh, it was fantastic. So we thought uh, the idea actually for this piece of research came from this group. So there was a load of anecdotal stuff. People were talking about where um, people had been successfully housed and where it, things were a little bit more difficult. And so we thought, well, why don't we go and ask people? Why don't we go and ask 
um, service users and also the frontline workers who are working with those people to support them into housing, but also the commissioners to see whether there's a relationship between the way services are commissioned, the way in which frontline workers are working, and most importantly, the way that people were using those services were, uh, were responding. So we asked um, basically about the uh, the mechanisms. What was it that seemed to be kind of effective in in, in all in, and then what wasn't? And Saskia um, did an amazing analysis, which she's going to talk a bit about. I think we just need to go up one slide. There we go. So we were interested in the experiences of accommodating people, obviously, uh, and one of the themes that came up was the changes which were due to to lockdown. So, and particularly kind of the communication of those changes. So some people were aware, some people were unaware. And where people seem to be, particularly the things that were effective was where the communications were clear, both for staff, but also for the people using the services. So we needed to be clear about what had changed, the things that were changing, and the ongoing changes in terms of guidelines. Staff experiences were particularly important. Um, and people, so a lot of the staff very much valued reflective practice, the ability to reflect on the, the, the where they perceive themselves as to have failed and they perceive successes and working out what those uh, what was kind of governing those things um, lots of lessons learned and particularly around the positives of lessons learned so people be, uh, were really appreciated seem to be appreciate actually reflecting on the positives and where things had uh, uh, again gone right now what they also picked up on moving around the barriers to inclusion particularly during the pandemic so some of the things that were still getting in the way and so some of the staff were kind of talking at some of the, particularly the, the service users were talking about um, the form of provision, the kind of uh, accommodation they were offered really still still not meeting their needs, um, whether it was out or whether there were too many, particularly if people had drug use issues um, and not wanting to go to a place where they would be in with a lot of people with it, particularly if they were trying to give up. So there were still barriers and the ability to be able to overcome those barriers was, was really important and the choice seemed to be really important. Um, lots of variations in um, client experience. Some described really great experiences and some described really not so great experiences. So as you were saying, Lord Boyd, uh, it wasn't always right. And the most important thing about some of this is we can start to unpack why for some people it didn't go well. And one of the biggest things was choice. So whether the choice that they had um, the, and whether the kind of the accommodation solution matched their to a certain extent their, um, their their needs and their experiences and um, we talked a little bit about the kind of quality of the communication that seemed to come particularly for the um, staff they were talking about really kind of being unclear about what maybe changes were were occurring possible to move on down to the quotes just on that's it Saskia are you with us okay I can't see her on the list of participants Nick Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, just that she did this work. I would love to take credit for it, but she did most of this work. Um, uh, it would have been lovely to, for her to have talked a bit about it. So um, just four sort of quotes from, from uh, people's, the people's voice. So sort of said, well, like, you know, they came once a week to a key work session to see what our needs were in the future and what we wanted to know. So obviously I've kind of ended up here. And so people really were crediting the staff and the staff input. One of the things that we found, we'll talk a bit about later, was the collaboration between agencies seemed to be one of the key things that people very much valued. And that was playing into also services of experience, where they noticed that people from different agencies were trying to serve their needs, and that became obvious. That was that was great. Um, so, and again, sort of about the staff. Uh, yeah, so, you know, they, they support you well. Uh, could they support you anywhere and uh, anymore? And part of them saying, well, actually, no, not really. You know, they sort of hinting that they would I think that they did all that they could do. And they felt the, the really important thing was they experienced being supported. And they felt supported. And so that relationship stuff comes massively down. Do you mind moving on, please? Um, I would have hoped that it really shows the kind of the streets were cleared you know, almost overnight. It shows it can be done. It shows that co homelessness can be cured. And this is one of, you know, one of uh, the people using services was saying this, that they, they were sort of reflecting what we kind of all saw is that it is possible to do this kind of stuff. And it's massively important to people um, because the services are, are there, right? You know, the opportunities are there, but it does how the accommodation out there, if it's thought about, if it's funded right, so people using services are acutely aware in, in, in this piece that are around, about where the funding, how the funding is operating. And if it's thought about, they want a consideration. 
And of course, you know, what, what one of the things we know tends to go well is if people have choice, if we can match the individual's need to some form of accommodation or give some sense of choice wherever that is, it tends to be much more useful. And the last slide. So the implications. Um, autonomy and choice need to be built in wherever possible. We need to be giving people choice about what it is because they know, people know themselves best. They know, you know, what it is that's going to be useful for them. And and sometimes if we browbeat people into stuff, they'll agree to something, but it won't last. And then we start to get kind of the repeated breakdown stuff. And we know that there's a kind of a, a shortage or there's certain provision which is available. But wherever possible, we need to be enabling agency. That collaborative work between agencies, massively important, particularly health, um, the voluntary sector. So two local charities and the local authority all talking to each other and all coordinating activity. So if somebody needs a, a, physical, a wound seeing, you've got a nurse available, they will go out to the hostel or they will go out to the, uh, the, to the street, identified by our vulnerable adult support team who know the population. And so the knowledge of the, of the uh, vulnerable adult support team matched up with the healthcare provision on the street or wherever people were, matched up to the kind of the local authority commissioning processes, really, really works well. And there's another piece of work that we'd like to do, understanding the mechanisms of collaboration. Why is it that collaborate, uh, collaboration um, is, uh, is so useful? And it's something about knowing people and something about um, talking, understanding people's languages. And there's all sorts of mechanisms that, that, that we, can, we can think about. We'd like to explore a little bit more. Reflective practice is really useful and staff being valued. Um, the, the particularly extra work, I think a lot of the services were picking up on that they noticed that staff were going the extra mile and they were doing things that weren't necessarily within a job description. And, and that was noted and, and very much valued. But of course, if we continue to do that, what we noted in the NHS is that there's a sort of, we can do that for a certain amount of time and then there's a danger of burnout if we don't support people through things like reflective practice. And, and lastly, kind of communication, particularly of changes. So people, people it's, it's, I mean, it seems to go wrong a little when people are unaware of changes or the changes occur very suddenly without any kind of rationale or knowledge. So thanks, uh, Saskia, I've got your message. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you both. And sorry, Saskia, that you weren't able to um, unmute, but it's a fantastic piece of work and um, really great to see uh, more of the stuff coming through. Um, and I'm sure we'll have some uh, a, a bit more detail on that um, in a future session, no doubt. Yeah, um, We'll move on now. Um, so uh, Eddie Hughes, uh, the new parliamentary undersecretary for um, housing, communities and local government, would was really keen to uh, send us a message. Um, he was unable to be here in person, um, but he's uh, kindly sent us a message. So we will just show that now. Good morning, and thank you for having me here today to speak as we reflect on all the great work over the past year as part of everyone in. Having previously worked as the Assistant Chief Exec of a charity helping young homeless people, Tackling homelessness really is a subject close to my heart. As the new Minister for Rough Sleeping and Housing, I really am excited about the prospect of working closely with people right across the sector. Charities to faith groups, think tanks and local councils. Rough sleeping is a hugely important issue that we need to have a real sense of urgency in tackling. And I've already been hugely impressed by the great work that's being done. I want to express my sincere gratitude to you all for the work that you've done together over the past 12 months to bring everyone in and keep them safe from COVID-19. I know this achievement would not have been possible without the health and homelessness systems working together like never before. I understand that in the South East, your network to share good practice, information and joint working is now well developed and you're continually learning from and developing each other. The result of this is that together you're delivering excellent services to such vulnerable members of our society. This joint working is a legacy that we in the government want to make sure is continued so that together we can meet our shared commitment to end rough sleeping. The impact of everyone in was demonstrated in the rough sleeping statistics where we've seen a 37% fall last year showing that we've helped a huge number of people. For a moment, 
I'd like to talk about one particular person. For privacy's sake, we'll call him Harry, who I came across on a recent visit. Up in North Lincolnshire, Harry had been sleeping rough for over 10 years in a small tent with no access to clean water or washing facilities. Prior to the pandemic, he had repeatedly told the council that he did not want to be helped. But everyone in changed that, giving the council new resources to approach him with a concrete offer of self-contained temporary accommodation. And over time, with help from council officers, healthcare professionals and dedicated support, Harry began to become more confident, having meaningful conversations with those that visited him, and perhaps, best of all, beginning to rebuild a loving relationship with his estranged family. That's just one small story out of thousands, 37,000 in fact, of people helped back on their feet by everyone in. Not just statistics, but real people given a second chance to pursue their dreams. Thanks to the incredible efforts of local government, charities and the wider sector, we've taken huge steps to protect rough sleepers and to reduce the number of people sleeping on the streets during the pandemic. But I have no sense of complacency. I know there's still lots to do to give everyone that second chance. It's only with real partnerships between central government, local government and the third sector that we can move forward. So I'd like to express my thanks to all of you and hope that you enjoy the rest of today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eddie. Um, I'm going to hand over to... Hi everyone, my name is Lucy Baker. I'm a Rough Sleeper Advisor. Um, I'm in a wider team of advisors that support local authorities directly with the Rough Sleeping Initiative um, in part of our, our work to, to reduce and end rough sleeping across England. I thought it would be helpful just to outline some of the government funding that's come through this year to help in that effort. So overall, government's provided more than 4.6 billion in unring fence grants to help local authorities manage um, COVID-19. Um, and some of that funding could have been uh, used to address homelessness and rough sleeping issues. Um, but there have been a number of, of separate funds um, specifically addressed um, towards rough sleeping. And in the southeast, I've kind of broken it down there to, to give a total that the rough sleeping specific funding is about 36 and a half million, um, which has come through the rough sleeping initiative. Um, an additional uh, specific fund around uh, COVID-19 um, in the very, very early days of the pandemic to, to get people in off the streets. Um, we then launched a programme called the Next Steps Accommodation Programme and the funding to the South East region through that was an additional 13 million. And then the Cold Weather Fund and Protect funding um, that we launched um, in uh, over the winter time, 1.7 million each. So there is, um, you know, that rough sleeping specific funding that's come through this year, which has obviously really helped to bring people in. Um, and then nationally, there is a um, couple of other wider funds that, that are going on at the moment. So in July, we launched the Rough Sleeping Accommodation Project, and that's 433 million of funding um, over four years. And this year, we brought that funding um, to represent 131 million of capital and 30 million revenue funding. And the whole idea of that programme is actually to increase the number of housing units available specifically to rough sleepers. So that is actually bringing on new, new housing for, for rough sleepers. Um, and then on top of that, jointly with, with PHE, there has been a 23 million drug and alcohol treatment funding. And of course, some of the areas in the southeast region are, are benefiting from that. Um, so overall, I just thought it was useful to highlight some of the, the funding that's that's happened, but also um, future funding. And we're just at the moment in the middle of working with local authorities around their rough sleeping initiative 2021-22 um, applications. Um, the, um, the remainder of which are, are due in uh, for the deadline tomorrow. So, so hopefully um, through through that and and the wider funds, we'll be able to to support our efforts in reducing rough sleeping across the country. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Lucy. It's been a phenomenal amount of investment over this last year in particular. Um, I'll hand over to Olivia now. Who's going to um, take us through the southeast response? Thanks, Emma. Um, I'll try and um, catch up on time by not repeating what others have said, but um, um, good morning, everybody. 
I will take you back to the start of our journey and then hand over to colleagues who have more to say about what's happened in the last 11 to 12 months. So um, I became involved with um, homeless, uh, the homeless healthcare to rough sleeping on the 22nd of March and um, just got copied in an email saying, you know, national colleagues in NHS England need a regional representative um, per region to uh, feed into this work. And you've got a map of the region there and it's it's a map represented from uh, an NHS perspective. So it's got six blobs of colours and it's got different uh, boundaries within that. But it's far more complex, as we've heard uh, from many people, because it, when tackling homelessness, it's not just health, it's housing, it's public health, it's charitable organisations and, and the boundaries and the organisations across the southeast um, can make it quite difficult to have a single coherent approach um, to responding to homelessness from um, different angles. So we've got some numbers there. So at the end of March, um, on that Sunday, where um, I eventually started an email dialogue with um, Olivia Butterworth, who has been our, our national lead in the NHS and has expertly coordinated with colleagues from uh, Public Health England and uh, the Ministry of Housing, um, the response to homelessness across the, the regions. She sent me the draft um, care and protect protocol that UCL had developed, and I think it took about three or four months for that protocol to be um, eventually um, made available on a website for the, the whole of England. Um, but at the time, things happened really quickly. So on the 25th of March, we had a national call um, and we were asked to try and gear up healthcare organisations and providers to support our colleagues in local authorities when the letter eventually came out. So if you go to the next slide, I think, on the 26th of March to say um, to um, councils, please make provisions to take everybody off the street by the end of the weekend. And we were really working at a really fast pace at the time. And um, someone mentioned, um, oh, Emma's doing the same as you doing from a Public Health England perspective. So Emma and I got in touch. And as it turned out, um, Emma, you'd organised a, a meeting already in the diary with some people on the 16th of April. And that first meeting on a Thursday, 16th of April at 11 o'clock, and be known to all of us, was the first in a really long series of meetings and workshops. And gradually we invited more people from different organisations and other people wanted to join. And you will see the, the, the numbers in a bit of how big this has grown, the breadth of what we've covered over the last 11 months, the achievement that um, giving people a significant challenge and a common purpose, regardless of job role, regardless of boundaries or organisations, um, is possible. And we've really moved mountains in a way that we probably would never have imagined a year ago. So there's some numbers here about the, the you know, more than 5,000 people who were housed, whether known homeless people or uh, people who needed emergency accommodation. Um, and the next slide has some of the kind of tick box requirement that we were given. But I think we can be really proud in thinking we didn't just tick the box. We tried really hard to address the issue and do it in a meaningful way and have a real impact for our local communities. And we've sustained that over the last 11 months. So well done. Thank you. And if I hand over to you now uh, for the network and the transition framework. Absolutely. Seamless. It's seamless. <laughs> so as, as Olivia said, so in that, that meeting in April, which basically, so the network is kind of uh, blossomed out of a, um, a, a kind of informal network that had begun on the PHE side out of some work that started in Southampton and Portsmouth kind of, and kind of Hampshire really um, with some work that we started around looking at the evidence around um, street sleeping um, and um, and and as kind of, you know so was was kind of there in its infancy and as you can see has kind of grown <laughs> exponentially as we've moved through this year and and kind of over 180 people from a wide range of um, organizations and backgrounds and 
um, into what it is now. And we've had kind of 40 webinars um, uh, and um, we've got the uh, new sort of subgroup around co-occurring mental health and substance misuse, which focuses on the five hotspot areas at the moment. Um, and um, the intention of that is will be to kind of spread some of that learning. But you can see the range of kind of stakeholders and people involved in the network. Um, next slide. And this just gives you a bit of a breakdown to give you a feel for the range of uh, people involved in the network and as, as you can see it's, it's it's massive which is testament to you guys and um, how we all come together next slide this is just a reminder so if you remember sort of quite quite near the beginning uh, during I suppose spring summertime we sort of asked you what you'd like to um, get from the network and what you'd like to hear about with the outer ring being the kind of most important things that came through um, and as you get down they were sort of the the less important things so we've tried to focus the webinar or the you know the kind of content um, around kind of those themes and and as you can see we've we've covered quite a lot of that as we've gone through the year um, and we'll be picking up more as we go through, but it just kind of a phenomenal amount of stuff. And you, you guys have obviously con contributed massively to the content of those webinars and sharing your um, fantastic work as we've gone through. Next slide. And, and obviously, um, we had a subgroup that worked on the development of the framework um, that I know many of you have been using um, locally to help inform your kind of strategy and the development of your uh, kind of system level plans going forward and um, which was endorsed by um, our key senior leaders across the southeast and um, Ah, oh, sorry, my network died for a second there. Um, and it's now been, um, we're looking at how we develop that further as we go forward. Okay, so this is me. Um, I'm going to talk about what, what the data tells us. You can have the next slide, please. So, um, this just reminds us um, what the situation was like um, before the pandemic and that we had a, an annual census of rough sleepers, which happened once a year. Um, and the count was observed rough sleepers, so people who were seen sleeping on the streets. So didn't include um, people who might be um, sleeping on other people's sofas or people who are at risk of homelessness. Um, and then following the pandemic, um, a data collection exercise began, which is much more robust. Still still could be better, but it's much more robust. Um, at present, it just um, counts people's housing status. So that's why it might it would be nice if it was included some health health data. But um, what we can tell from that data is that since the start of the pandemic, 5,661 5, people rough sleeping or at risk of rough sleeping have been supported into emergency accommodation or removal accommodation in the southeast. And on the right hand side, you can see sort of diagrammatically um, a bit of a breakdown of that. And at the bottom um, right, um, we've got 900 rough sleepers in autumn 2019. Autumn 2020, which isn't shown, there were 456 rough sleepers in the southeast. December 2020, 290, and December 2021, 249. So, so it gives you some idea of the, the scale of the effort. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is um, what I shared with um, Baroness Casey and Lord Bird to, um, in order to um, get them along to this call and to, to tell them what we've achieved in the southeast because the discussion around homelessness tends to be london cent centric and um this slide which um, had data at 
September 2020 showed that our, our effort um, of housing people was second only to London in the in the of the all the regions, all the regions in England. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, this was the position in January 2021. Um, so the Northwest um, had just um, 159 people housed more than us. Next slide, please. And this shows you the breakdown by local authorities, and you can see what we call the five hotspot areas, uh, Southampton, Portsmouth, Brighton and Hove, Oxford, Reading, um, are you know, at, at the top of um, the numbers of people helped into accommodation. But it also shows you the spread across all parts of the southeast, including some very rural local authorities there. Can I have the next slide, please? And this um, tries to capture what the picture looks like um, with uh, upper tier local authorities. So it gives gives you a more balanced view, if you like, that um, every county council or every upper tier local authority um, has has done quite a lot of work and worked with their lower tier local authorities in order to make this happen. So that's quite um, that's what that slide shows you. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Um, Emma's having some technical problems, so I'll be doing the transitions. Um, Marie, some examples of things that um, system colleagues, um, public health, uh, housing, health colleagues have shared with us to celebrate our joint achievement. Yeah, so uh, my name is Marie Gerald. I'm also from the MHCLG. I work alongside Lucy in the advisor team. And I think, you know, what, what the next few uh, slides are going to show is just the almost the unintended consequences of the pandemic and, and the positive unintended consequences of all this joint working was all thrown together at the beginning and created some really good systems that are going to continue, I hope, in the future. And so when we was asking for feedback, um, you know, that came through loud and clear. The partnership working now, um, in particular between um, health and housing, is extremely strong. Um, things were set up um, in haste and and were um, and worked extraordinary work extraordinarily well, um, and also working in a completely different way. You know, the virtual world that we we're now sitting in means that you know we have some you know um, connection issues. You know, when we got to know each other in that way as well, but also kind of having to adapt um, how we work with our service users, uh, how to deliver those rough sleeper interventions. And that's kind of reflected in, in this slide and it comes through loud and clear. You know, the partnership working um, in particular between health and housing um, and what everyone has been able to achieve is absolutely phenomenal. So um, hopefully that's reflected in this slide. Um, can I have the next one, please? Thank you. So these were reflections from um, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. And again, you know, this is... Um, something that demonstrates and whilst we haven't got a lot of context behind some of these uh, phrases and words um you can take from it you know some of the the key and critical things that we we've seen over the last 12 months and um, again working with the districts working with primary care mental health services you know um has come through that as a uh, certainly a foundation of what we need to move forward in terms of um, getting the right support and appropriate support for uh, rough sleepers, but really trying to work together in partnerships um, to ensure that there's um, pathways and there's the word vision there as well, um, look into the future. Thank you. So just to talk about some of um, some good examples, and, and it just so happens I cover Kent, Surrey, Sussex. So these are from um, my areas. Um, so firstly, over in Hampshire, uh, Winchester, um, there was a project to identify higher risk and vulnerably housed adults um, and code them correctly um, as high risk. And therefore, they was able to be offered the vaccination within the, the tier four group, which is fantastic. And out of the 114 vulnerably, 114 vulnerably housed, um, they managed to vaccinate 60% um, 60 of them 
uh, vaccinated 75% and 90% of those deemed street homeless and living at the night shelters respectively. So fantastic effort. And then over in Crawley, um, they had a vaccination bus. Fantastic. Um, and just goes to show some um, innovative ways that people are trying to um, vaccinate this, this population, which is just absolutely brilliant. Um, a converted metro bus. Um, and it been set up by a group of 44 GP services called the Alliance for Better Care, ABC. I love an acronym. So that's a good one. Um, and then over in Brighton, um, Arch is a um, is a GP by surgery uh, specialising in, in supporting people uh, that are rough sleeping and homeless. And I have to say, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, they came in very quickly to work alongside Brighton to set up a, a COVID protect model um, for everyone that was brought in through the Everyone In. Um, and they continue to evolve alongside um, the local authority and be very, very responsive. And this is an example of that and a continuation of that um, innovation and the quick response that, that we are you know, almost ex expecting now um, from some of these services. And I'm just going to pass over to um, Lucy to talk about um, Hastings. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to highlight the Seaview project um, in Hastings. So they provide a range of support services for people experiencing homelessness, who, as we know, often experience physical, mental health and substance misuse issues too. Seaview is a wellbeing centre where individuals can access a range of services, including healthcare. They work in partnership with St John's Ambulance. The health service there is nurse led and they work closely with the Rough Sleeper Initiative funded nurse that works across East Sussex. They have a very well equipped clinical room and they also provide podiatry services. They carry out health assessments as well as wound care and health advice and people are also referred to local GPs. And during Covid, a St John's ambulance was used to take services to people experiencing homelessness and also helped in the delivery of Covid vaccinations. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. So Whilst um, Sarah is lining up our next um, video from uh, Baroness Louise Casey, I will just um, give you a bit of background on, on um, Baroness Casey. So she was the Deputy Director of Shelter in 1992 and the Head of the Rough Sleepers Unit in 1999. She's also a Director of the National Antisocial Behaviour Unit and the Head of the Respect Task Force. Um, why um, Baroness Louise Casey is really important to our work is that in February 2020, she was appointed as uh, the advisor, one of the advisors to help tackle homelessness and then as the chair of the Rough Sleeping Task Force in July 2020. Um, Oh, sorry, and in July 2020, she was nominated for a crossbench peerage. And Louise, just like Lord Bird, wanted to say thank you. So here's Louise's video. Um, good afternoon. I was asked just to give a really quick message um, of thanks, which is my absolute privilege and honour to do. Um, I understand that colleagues in the South East um, at sort of uh, strategic level, you've been meeting now once a fortnight since March last year, and we're almost in March, uh, and that you've been working together to try and make sure that people who are homeless and rough sleeping were as much as we could protected and protected from the pandemic, but also in off the streets and uh, able to look at all of the other issues those people were facing. Uh, London often gets a lot of the attention, so I was really pleased to hear from colleagues in the South East. Um, it's not an insignificant number of people that you've helped. 5,000 people uh, is phenomenal. I think it's second highest numbers to anywhere else in the country bar London. I think the other thing is that uh, if you think about it, this is certainly for me the first time in my career where essentially we've had to just completely make sure that across the public sector, we've all been working together hand in hand from health, homelessness, voluntary sector, all together to make sure that we could do the best we possibly could to protect those people from the pandemic and give them a fighting chance to self-isolate if they needed to. And now as we move through, uh, that we're actually able to get on top of their other health needs. What I wanted to say is I completely get how relentless that is and that actually 
you know the cloud the clouds haven't uh, moved away yet the, you know the, the waters haven't settled um, and, and the boats are still really choppy so I realize that it's like running a marathon every single day um, and I really thank you for that um, and think you've just done and need to continue to do I'm afraid a phenomenal job but um, you're much respected and much valued, certainly by me, as well as by many other pe members of the public out there. So listen, thanks so much and do keep it up. And I hope um, at some time in the future we can meet in different circumstances. Good luck and thank you. And with that, we come to the end of that. Apologies if I uh, lost my connection halfway through. but. Um, Thank you very much for picking up the pieces um, and I hope you um, enjoyed uh, the, the morning and kind of hearing from everybody and uh, sharing in the fantastic work that's been going on um, all year and that will continue to go on, I know. Um, and just want to echo the thanks from everybody for all the hard work that's happening and will continue to happen.